Um, just to say, I hope you uh, uh, don't mind, but I'm, I'm going to uh, approach today's conversation uh, with Linda as a matter of uh, art and life, for want of better words, starting at the beginning. Uh, I'm, I'm bound to, to get things wrong, I feel, uh, so That's please okay. be gentle, <laughs> all of you. Uh, um, on Wikipedia, I read that Lake Charles, Louisiana, is a growing city which is considered to be a major centre of tourism, gaming, education and petrochemical refining. <laughs> And cowboys and cowgirls. <laughs> it has a rodeo uh, ag college. So I grew up with horses yeah. in my backyard. Tell me, tell me more about that, your, your youth in Louisiana. What kind of place is that? Uh, full of bayous. And uh, uh, as, as a member, I had my own motorboat. So I went through all the bayous. I got to know the rivers and the big lake that connected the to the Gulf, basically, and I went everywhere. Was there always a yearning for you to, to, to leave it, to, to get to the big city? Uh, absolutely, but I got there when I was 11, yeah. and then went to Europe, to Greece, and that changed my life. Yeah. I love travel after that. <coughs> what were you doing, what did you do in Greece? What were you I, I, I actually, uh, <coughs> my, my mother let me go at that age, and um, her own, uh, sister was amazed that, that she let me do that. But then my mother had two other children, little boys, and also a, I had a sister that was there. So she, she had enough to deal with, although I was the babysitter very early on. And I went and, to Greece, and I stayed four to five months with my grandmother, and we went also to France. So that gave me an idea of another world outside of Louisiana. And we, we spoke briefly about this last night, but you arrived in New York, you, you say, around about 65, 66. Um, and that's your, and you came to a, a New York, clearly one that's uh, very different to what it is at the moment, but you mentioned immediately, or fairly soon, you were meeting artists like Barnett Newman, uh, Barbara Rose, Stella. What was, what was New York like then? What was the art scene like there? It was a very small art scene. <clears throat> I met Warhol. And uh, I remember uh, at, at a very small party, I think it could have even been for Bridget Riley, uh, her first opening there. And uh, I, I uh, was trying to get him fairly inebriated with tall glasses of scotch, and he didn't seem to be any more or less than what he was. And then only after he finished a couple, of this size, he said, that, would you like to be in a film, you and your boyfriend, my Scottish mate, Gordon Hart. And uh, I realized that I didn't want to be Warhol's object, so it sort of got me thinking about what, who, and how, and why should I even be anybody's object. So that got me into thinking about uh, the media. That's, that, that's an interesting moment, isn't it? Because you said you didn't, you didn't want to be a Warhol groupie. You didn't, you, you, he'd asked you to be in a film with, with, with your, as, your husband, a, Gordon, Gordon Hart. Well, I mean, yeah. he may not have been my husband at that time. Oh, yeah. But that didn't have to do with it. It really yes. had to do with the idea of being someone's object in a film. And, well, he wanted us to make love. I mean, how many people would say, oh, yeah, I'll go yeah. make love in a Warhol film. <laughs> you, you, you became very good friends with Barnett Newman. Yes. I, you, you also mentioned you liked to dance into the wee hours. I can't imagine this man dancing. <laughs> well, Annalie was very worried about, he could do the jitterbug, but he had a, he had a very bad heart, so, yeah. and he had been warned. And so Annalie uh, was a school teacher. She supported Barney, and they lived in a Thurber, like, they were out of a Thurber cartoon. They really looked very Thurber-esque. Their house was this leather, one leather chair, one leather couch. And then there was this uh, this I-beam stuck into a cow pie in plaster. He later cast it, of course. At, and uh, he worked with Lippincott. Actually, I met Barnett Newman <coughs> uh, through Bob Murray, a Canadian artist that hung out with him and introduced him to Lippincott. Murray still works with steel sculptures and so forth. And uh, <coughs> Newman uh, did some large sculpture pieces and it was through Leppincott. 
were they what was the, what was the art, artists relationship to each other like at that point were they generally supportive of each other or <coughs> well barney newman was an extraordinary person in that he could treat a taxi driver in the same way that he could treat uh, you know a young artist he was uh, really had a lot of style in that and uh, his father was a uh, haberdasher and uh, so he wore these tweed hats, and he was just a very wonderful, and he had a monocle, you might have seen some photographs of them, and uh, <laughs> Vogue. I love our microphone performance. I, I said you work. could stay here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, coming, coming around the same time as the, the four paintings, which will come to our, a, a group of more wall-mounted works. <laughs> Um, that take us through the mid, uh, mid to late 60s and into 1970. And one of those earliest uh, works is a work from here called Untitled Wax Piece from 1966. Um, wax on gesso on masonite. How, how did you come to make this work? Well, <clears throat> at that time, I I'd, I'd met a new Richard Tuttle. And uh, I'd seen... But Prior to that, I'd actually seen a piece of his at Sam Wagstaff's, and it was a kind of shaped uh, board, a thin board, uh, kind of hollow. I think it was made maybe with masonite and painted slightly pink, and or slightly kind of these awful pastel colors that uh, you know were, were his first works, but they they were. They were very interesting because you didn't know why or how they came about. They just appeared. And so I was taken in by the idea of the shaped canvas that was going on at, generally at the time. Stella had begun uh, abandoning his kind of Cairo concentric paintings, and he began to play with shape. <clears throat> and I saw Tuttle's work, and I responded. Uh, to the idea of a shape, and I thought a shape and surface uh, was a kind of, uh, I wanted to objectify the idea of a shape being a painting, a shape and surface, so I began to make my own surfaces as well as my own paint in the encaustic way, in the encaustic method, and I also traded Tuttle at that time, uh, a gray painting, with a hole in it, and I did the holes because I watched the wax kind of drip in, and I did another Lawson-shaped painting that was as long or tall as I was, tall or short, as the case may be, and then built it up very much and had three holes in it. And it was kind of a way of, of referencing the body and, and uh, also the paint as skin. So. We had some other works here at the time, I'm thinking... That was, uh, that was prior to the... That was the first painting that I did, actually. This is uh, a red painting. And I did a, a larger one, and I think I, I threw them out because I had a basement studio, and then I was moving for the summer into a so-called loft on Broom Street. Uh, I'd taken up somebody's studio over, and I couldn't carry everything over to the next studio, so some of them I threw out. Talk about this work here. How are these works made? Well, I finally decided on this 36 inch long painting as a, a format that I probably really uh, imagined and did the changes over the years through my pouring at different uh, schools around the country. I was invited to different colleges and museums around the country and did installations. and. I abandoned the painting for a while. First, they, the lozenge were, were smooth, and I did two. There was a friend of mine, uh, Ron Garchoff, that was doing two paddle paintings on a canvas, and we immediately became friends. And he still uh, is a very close friend of mine and, and thought the same way about painting as, as I did, that uh, it was kind of an open-ended uh, uh, statement about surface and about form. And he has since done these concave, convex, shape 
pieces that almost might suggest a mask but aren't, and they're beautifully painted. He's going to show with Chime and Reed in uh, April, I think. Mm -hmm. his, his show's coming out soon. He's 85 years old now. Uh, <clears throat> these paintings, uh, I kept doing them after the installations. Uh, and the first large floor painting was done in uh, this space, as you see it, and I poured it on top of uh, linoleum. In the back, uh, you see uh, a painting by Bryce Martin, and in the very, very back, I think that's one of my corner pieces. And this, this is uh, a painting that, when I showed another related at the Bikert Gallery in a group show opposite Chuck Close in, in one room, uh, Darren Slavin was there and also Saul Lewitt, and uh, both of them mentioned, but it was particularly, I remember Dan Slavin standing over this painting called Bounce uh, that I had alluded to the corner and said, uh, this painting has figured ground. And if you could believe it, there were hundreds of people that would gather at NYU and other places where Barbara Rose may, may have been mon monitoring the discussion. Um, and to talk about, is Easel painting down, de dead? And is, uh, what's the nature of the figure ground? Uh, there should be no figure, and what is ground? So there were rules about painting. And one of the rules, as Flava mentioned, I like this painting, but I like the other one better because it was marbleized. And, and he said, there's a figure in the ground here. I mean, that was a rule. You know, it was very funny. And I thought that it, I, I had taken logic from this great logician that was a brother of Jason. His name was Jason Zanakis, and Zanakis, the musician and, who worked with Corbusier at the time. So for me, I, and also I'd worked in the gallery part time, so I cut through a lot of information and uh, thinking these rules were, rules are made to be broken. I've heard people um, talk about them as floor paintings. I read someone, someone referring to these as, as fallen paintings. And, um, uh, and I, I think I read somewhere where you referred to them as um, uh, toxic uh, oil slicks on the bayou, or reminiscent of? Well, I, I remember that in my motorboat days. Uh, the oil slicks, Lake Charles did, as you mentioned, have an oil refinery. And uh, I would see these uh, rainbow fluorescence uh, uh, images, yeah. or, or not, <laughs> you know, on, on, on the surface of the water. And so the, the, the fact is that I was alluding also to my experiences of childhood. I was, I was interested also reading a Dave Hickey essay, essay in your Emma catalogue where he recalls going to see one of your very early shows and seeing one of these works for the first time, at which point one of his friends leans over to him and gasps and says, the floor is the new wall. <laughs> and, uh, and I kind of, kind of, get that sense that this is a period where, where the floor works are, are becoming exciting and of interest to people, the rise of Andre and others. But also, how do people react to these works? I mean, they're not expecting work to be down there, are they? Well, the, this, I think this was the first time I, I knew of Carl Andre's work and I knew of the situation here. I first uh, saw him in New York uh, uh, and uh, I went to his openings, and, and uh, uh, I knew the Sarah, and I knew Eva Hess. I knew all of these artists and their works, but it was really the first time that someone had used color, and I was invited to the Whitney Anti-Illusion Process Show, and I brought two, I actually did two large paintings of which you see the, the one here called Contragon, and the other one was called Planet. At that time, we were on the moon, and we were looking back at ourselves. So my gestures weren't expressionistic. They were about a different feeling about matter. And we, everything changed when we were looking back at ourselves. There was a, there was a sense of irony that began to occur. 
it's, it's interesting you talk about lakes because I think Andre was canoeing or something on a lake when he got the idea that sculpture could be uh, flat, flat and, and be meaningful as, a, as yeah. an object in that in that state. But also, I mean, I, I, I'm intrigued to know what happened. I didn't know that. Yeah. Maybe he yeah. felt insecure, so he wanted yeah. to plate the lake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine him being good at the work. Um, uh, what happened, if, if you don't mind, at the Whitney in in, in sixty nine? Um, there, 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 you you ended up withdrawing your work in the end. I did because uh, finally they said it popped up from the floor. Marsha Tucker and Jim Monty were curators at that time. I think Jim Monty gave up and became a bartender at uh, Finelli's <laughs> on Prince Street, which was the the beginning of Soho. And uh, Marsha went on to have her own museum backed by Vera Liss. Uh, I, I did a piece after this. I was commissioned by Vera Liss and Cy Newhouse of Condé Nash and Vogue and other magazines to do works in situ. Uh, Cy had a penthouse. I did one outside. And Vera, I did one in her bathroom, and she said, well, you must give my husband, it's a beautiful 20s bathroom, black uh, detailing, black tile, and white, all white, and 20s. And uh, I did a big lipstick color uh, form, piles of polyurethane foam, in the corner, and she said, just please leave my husband enough, enough room to back off from the toilet, which was on the other side. <laughs> and I did. Uh, it remained there, I think, um, you know, until they, they died or she might have moved. And then she liked that so much, she wanted one on the stairs into the garden, and I said, I just can't do one on the steps. I thought that was too tricky. Later, the Merchantsons, Clint Merchantson of the Dallas Cowboys and the big Texas people, uh, conservative, uh, had a show <laughs> Janie C. Leeds in Texas, and then I was then I was invited to uh, Germany uh, with with all of this uh, kind of interest in, in the forums. I had been invited to Germany uh, very early on when Voice was there, and had a show. Actually, the the dealer there w was showing Voice drawings, and I had the poured pieces. And so it, it was all new, new to everyone. And, um, and Murchison wanted something for his trains. Vera wanted something, you know, that he could actually ride through. And I said I wouldn't do it. So his wife said, well, you should go back to Germany where you belong, because I mentioned I was having a show in Germany. And in Germany, when I was actually doing the pours, the <coughs> secretary crossed the hall, and she said, in Hitler's day, this would have never happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was there was some commentary at the time which suggested that the four paintings were 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 part of the process art movement at that moment. But you, you resisted that notion. You, you didn't you didn't see it that way. Well, the the whole so-called process movement was a closed system and and very deductive, and I was involved with a very open system inductive reasoning and art, which art is open as science. I must say, it must have given you immeasurable pleasure just to pour these big tubs of latex about the place. I mean, the, 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 how, how did you come across the material? Where were you buying the, these tubs from? Oh, there, there was a I went to the walking the yellow pages and there was a fellow called M.P. Medwick that had been, was a rubber consultant during World War II. So he made new, the new plastics. He invented the idea of the polyurethane in the picture frame and doing other things. And he won his case. In fact, he was winning his case as, as I was ordering the urethane foam. And he used to be very, I, I, I had access to his scientist and, and the chemist. In, in his production facility, so they would make what I, they were making it anyway, they would make five gallon containers, two component systems, 
uh, six pound density polyurethane and I switched to the urethane realizing that the latex itself uh, would not confront you. It was a passive and I wanted something. Finally, somehow I wanted to get up off the floor, up out of the corners, around the corners that I did in Germany. And so the first piece up off the floor was done in New in actually I think it was in, in in Germany because there was a floating wall in front of some windows and I wanted to use that wall. So I, I decided to make a kind of skeleton and then pour over that. I was pouring over polyethylene anyway to remove you know the, the work from the floor and to keep the floor clean. And the cho and the choice of colours, these bright day glow the Dayglow colors, actually, they're just color without the addition of black, just as black as all color. Uh, so that's what Dayglow is. And at that time, I also experimented with phosphorescence when I was doing the wall works. And I was invited to many museums around uh, the US. And I was not able to do Chicago or uh, when they invited me or, or Buffalo, but but I, I did MIT, that was one of the last the first, one museums, of the faster. One of the first times I saw one of your floor paintings was um, not so long ago, and it was as part of a, an exhibition called hard Ti uh, High Times, Hard Times, which was at the National Academy Museum uh, in New York. And um, it was a quite an unusual show. Did you, did you get to see that show? Yes, I did. Uh, it, it received a lot of publicity because the, uh, there were curators uh, that actually put together the show. They're a team of curators that actually did that. And, there, and it was a great sense of camaraderie. I think it was That's very much the, curated within its generation. Everyone within uh, the, the 60s, was, 60s yeah. and 70s. It was a wonderful historical show. Yeah. It included works by, among others, Lee Lozano, Elizabeth Murray, Murray uh, and Dorothea Rockburn. Um, whose work I just wanted to show you there. That's an early 60s work by her, which is oil-stained sheets of wood. But um, it, it, re it really brought together a kind of overview of a certain generation, I felt, that show. And, and actually, Dorothea had done the piece, uh, piece of oil uh, in the Bikert Gallery and left the stains. No, I, I think she did it later. But what, what happened, I, I did something before the Whitney had asked me. Oh, it was after the Whitney had asked me when I had to pull out the painting of color because they it popped up from the floor, Marcia Tucker said. And no one wanted it. Richard Serra didn't want it next to his lead piece. Ryman didn't want it next to his white painting that was next to the lead piece. No one wanted it within any sight <laughs> of them and their work. So and and so I had to uh, take it out finally at the opening day and because I realized they wanted to put half of it on the wall and half of it on the floor and it was really meant to be walked around. But Dorothea did a piece and left a big oil stain. On the, um, I did a piece, left my latex stain in answer to this colored, you know, kind of prejudice. And, and Dorothea later came along and had the whole bikert floor redone so that she could do her very elegant work mm. uh, in the oil. That's beautiful work. Um, we now look at some of your um, more elaborate floor paintings, or at least they begin to start to come way off the floor. They, they started to come. And that was semi-flexible polyurethane foam. I did the smaller pieces, the flexible ones. The paintings themselves of rubber could be rolled up, and these could be sort of bent because they were flexible. I have this small studio doorway in uh, Little Italy. So it's, it's, it's an extension of the floor paintings? And it is. Yeah. I, I th think these were very transitional works. I sent some to Germany. This is a phosphorescent work, I, and I had a spray booth where I, I did uh, I, created a surface, ultraviolet resistance surface for these pieces. And, and um, I did send a lot of them to Germany, one uh, in the show there. And then when I actually, and he brought them to a fair, this is Muller, uh, who later had two 
floors and gallery house, and later I sent all the polyurethane on, on, from MP Medwick, from this area, where I was ordering at, to Germany, and did that installation, which I spoke of before, where I was really working much larger. So this is a piece called uh, For Carl Andre that I did in uh, Texas uh, in lieu of creating a tunnel for uh, the Merchantsons. Uh, I, uh, Henry, um, he was head of the Venice Biennale. Uh, I can't think of his last name right now, but uh, he asked me to do a piece in situ at the <coughs> museum and I call this for Carl Andre at the Dallas Fort Worth. It's in Fort Worth. Fort Worth Museum owns it, and they've loaned it out occasionally. But I did it right in that corner that you see pictured. I just wanted to show you an, another cutting, which in itself is quite oh. intriguing. Um, if only it's the Dallas Times Herald, and there you are uh, making a, a larger version of a similar one. I've not ever seen that. You're on the same page as. Some pretty racy material, it must be said. Uh, there's a strip tease, there's an underground movie. Oh, wonderful. I'd like a copy of this. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> the Screen Test Girl. Oh, that's great. That. That's, the, that's Dallas for you. Well, but someone yeah, knew what they were doing when they put that together. Yeah, I think it, it maybe precedes uh, many of the things that come next. Um, this is a work called Come. Which is uh, uh, by now I'm thinking you're 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 starting to cast the latex works in in, in metals. Well, in this aluminium. was polyurethane, the rigid, and that was the first yeah. uh, one of the first in the in the round pieces that I liked, and then I did another one called Eat Meat, and then cast it. I got a Guggenheim of ten thousand dollars, and I was able to cast a lot of pieces at that time. This was sand casting, as, as was Eat Meat, which is also in the show now. Which is here in bronze. Which is here in bronze, and I've had it out in Long Island all of these years in a patio. I, I built a studio. I like to design and build studios. I have a couple in New Mexico and one in Long Island. I just wanted to show you, this is a, a, a fairly recent shot uh, from the Whitney. Um, actually, That's Paula Cooper Gallery. Uh, is that the I Whitney? I think this is the Whitney. Oh. It claims to be in the catalogue. It says 1990. <coughs> Sorry about this. Um, and it's yes. uh, uh, a number of these uh, works in, in, in together. That's wing in the background. Um, I, I did a show of your work, in, including your work in London um, a, a year and a half ago, um, where I was interested to put you um, alongside three other, um, two other uh, artists. Uh, in this case, Louise Bourgeois and the Polish artist uh, Alina Szyposznikow. And the thoughts I was having at the time in terms of bringing you into context with these people was the sense of artists um, working with the new materials of the day at that time. This is a, a, a work by Alina Shaposhnikov where she's basically spray injected uh, urethane into a pair of tights, which has gone wrong, which she liked, the, the way it had gone wrong and she left as a work. Um, and in a way, the emphasis of the show on a certain level was to um, uh, introduced the idea that especially women artists were, were embracing some of these new materials, these, these uh, new polymers, polyurethanes, latex. And I, didn't, I never knew whether or not that was perhaps a reaction to um, uh, the sort of monumentality of sculpture that had been perhaps been going on beforehand, uh, in, in, a, in the looser sense, the sort of male uh, mo mo monumental sculpture that had been taking place, and whether it was not uh, possibly the case that. That, 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 that these materials opened them themselves up to a whole new kind of artist working, you know, I never materials. thought of it that way, but the, I, I mean, it, it sounds reasonable what you're saying. I mean, this is uh, Louise Bourgeois. Mm -hmm. There's a work called Soft Landscape. <clears throat> and um, and it, again, it interests me that the, the pores and, the, it, and, and, and these, these works, but things are literally just, just left to be, you know, they're just, they're kind of dollops of sorts. And this, way of working seemed to come to the fore at one point. It works, I think Bourgeois hands comes at it completely different in these are bronze cars. Yeah, I think a lot of it, she was very involved with going to Italy and working in stone as well. So these works also have been done in stone, yeah. marble. Yeah. I, I think a lot of my uh, attempts at uh, 
have to do also with cooking <laughs> and recipes <laughs> and my interest in chemistry. That's <laughs> um, true. Um, we'll come back to that. This is Wing. Yes. Um, and Interesting view. It is indeed. Huh? Um, what, how, how, this, is, this is an amazing process, I think, the way that you make these works. Can you talk a little about what, what, how did you come to start working like this? We're now way off the floor. We're back on the wall. Is now the new wall. This is an interesting piece that's now destroyed. And that, no, actually, that's that's at uh, Kansas State University. This is the work that traveled in the retrospective that was finally. It's a survey show actually that uh, Judith Tannenbaum uh, got when the show traveled and arrived in Rhode Island in America for the first time. So th that, that's me with, uh, I wore goggles because the fumes actually could tear you, they're quite strong. Later, uh, I had my own air system at MIT, and if I did anything later, which I did do, I uh, had my own air system, which when I won the a World's Fair contest, I actually did a, a large cantilever piece. It was. I found that the, the foam itself, in terms of scale and the way I poured, could be 17 and a half feet long in scale and, and cantilever. And that was the extent in which the pours and the scale were consistent. And so there you see that I'm, I'm still learning if I can kind of cantilever the weight which was sometimes as much as two to three to four hundred pounds from a sheet rock wall, which just glue itself on there. And rather than risk the idea of it tearing down the sheet rock later, I would put just one of the sticks of the one by twos against the wall, screw it in. So I would pour a, literally on top of that and the plastic and then remove the plastic, but the one by two would still be on the wall too. So, but it, Adhesive Products, that was the name of the company. And it was appropriate for the material. I've heard mention of the word prehistoric used in relation to your work. This, this sense of its timelessness, of it being natural form, classical sculpture, ever, it's something ageless about it. What, what, what's well, that, that, was, that one actually is phosphorescent. This was a series of five phosphorescent pieces. There it is there. Oh. This is it, with the lights off. It's an extraordinary piece, uh, Linda. I, 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 uh, can we see this somewhere? Is there a possibility? Well, the Kansas uh, State University owns, owns it, and they actually sold one of the pieces, mm. which they shouldn't have. Mm. Uh, and uh, luckily, Judith was able to get the one on the left uh, for the exhibition. Um, I think that, that if, I, if I understand correctly, you had a com computer-controlled lighting system, so it was... I, I did, but yeah. in this... Sh I don't know whether this shot is in Kansas or... Looks like uh, it's... Yeah. I need to check where it is. Yeah. Uh, I think this is it. I think this is... Uh, This is the original piece at, at Kansas. But there was vapor lighting. And what was interesting about the vapor lighting was that it would be turned off, and then on turning it off, it would also rise up in space. So it kind of contradicted uh, what you were really, what you knew about the piece, which it, it flowed down. But the phosphorescent being more bright at the top would rise. And so it was really an interesting movement. This just looks more like the uh, new museum shot, I don't know, but and this because when the black light was on it, it looked more like marble. And we decided to use the black lighting because the piece that was uh, given to a pop art collector in Kansas, actually he had it out in a smoke filled room and they lived with it for 40 years. So it was, uh, it had acquired some dust, and we never attempted to clean it, but we just, I decided uh, to go with the way it was being shown at 
the new museum, so I think this is the new museum installation, which was wonderful actually to see it with the black light because it did something differently and brought in the fifth piece that had been contaminated. These are the hoofers. Is that how, you, how I should say it? Hoofer? Yeah, but that's just one. What happened to the other foot? There. Oh. <laughs> they're, they're singled out. Yeah, well, they're a, a pair, yeah. and they were beautifully arranged in the gallery, so yeah. please look at them and together. And I saw a tap dancing group from Harvard, and it was on the Lower East Side where I lived at the time, and I was very taken in by their energy and their sparkle. They, they were wonderful, and so I named the Hoofers after them. <laughs> this is a, a picture I just wanted to include, really, oh, yes. mainly because I liked it a lot. I was a fan of uh, James Dean and Robert Morris. They were born on the same day. <laughs> where was this picture taken? This, I had a Porsche. And I was at Cal Arts at the time, and it was, uh, I had a lot of uh, young students, and the feminist movement was there, so, and the earthquake had just happened, happened and Charlie Manson had just done his thing, and there was a, a acquaintance of mine that was doing the billboards that had taken the earlier photographs of uh, the latex, me and the latex painting, in, 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 the, in the large uh, loft. Anyway, he picked me up in between running out of material at the Walker Museum installation, the new opening of the new Walker Museum. And um, I was later invited to Cal Arts. I was very taken with California. Within a year and a half, I was teaching at Cal Arts. So I had a student photograph me with a wide angle lens. I'm that wide now, but then <laughs> I was quite thin. And, and I decided I would. I coined the term Macharina because I thought the, uh, the feminine ego or the feminist should have a, a word for their machismo. And, and so I was, that was my Macharina pose. And I continued to do different poses, uh, working out to the one that was in art form. We, we, we just talked a little bit about one of the reasons that um, you mentioned one of the reasons you were attracted to LA was because it, it part a small thing, but it was they sort of they had a mockery uh, of the of the Hollywood stars, uh, the, the, all the Hollywood stars were being mocked in some uh, way that was in, of interest to you. Can you tell, tell me? Well, bit? John Baltasari and I shared a class, and we would take the the students around to the grave of Marilyn Monroe. We would, you know, we were interested in all to the David of Michelangelo. We were, we were interested in all the icons of L.A. And so I think it was, again, it was the sense of irony and looking back at ourselves. And this, uh, and the Cal Arts uh, students were very bright. And so it was the beginning of a kind of uh, the joke art and conceptualism and and um, so I was a part of that, and that I was there, and I was thinking uh, with the videotapes prior to that, what, what was new was, was reel-to-reel -reel video, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was doing a lot of video when I was teaching at Rochester, because I'd been in Life magazine with Richard Serra, Richard Van Buren, and Eva Hess. So I got a job in, in the university as an assistant professor, and spent the money on the urethane. So, and video. And so began a sort of period of the mockery series, as it were. And well, alluding to sexuality. Okay, so here we go. Machismo, macharina. So th this, I stated earlier, there was a fellow from the tape doing a little, uh, little piece about sexuality. <laughs> and this was my humanist view and humor uh, view of both sexes. I decided to... <laughs> take the male organ and uh, pose with it. You said um, something that, you, it was to mock the idea of having to take sexual sides to be either a male artist or a female. I was also, I will... But the sexuality issue was so sensitive that I decided to, and same with the videotape that's now being shown, I decided to pr pr 
present sexuality. Uh, in other words, just a little kind of forward facing with sunglasses. In other words, just l look at it point blank. Uh, and not take sides. I was uh, walking the line. Um, you said that um, you conceived it as a real project for Art Forum and showed it to the editor, John Copeland, who said that it couldn't happen as a centerfold, but you could buy the pages. Apparently you said, fine, I'll buy them. You paid $3,000, and you went on to say, which was a lot of money then, you could buy a loft for $5,000. That's right. I should have bought the lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Um, actually, a double page ad in R4 now is eight thousand four hundred dollars. Where I would say Can't maybe buy a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, it, it caused a huge furore, as we know, and uh, as, as, as subsequently, five associate editors of. Uh, art forum um, would would complain. They denounced the the, the, the presence of this advert, uh, which led to Rosalind Krauss's resignation. And Interestingly she enough, she's the one that photographed Bob Morris in the chains with the uh, German helmet. Yeah. <coughs> and I didn't know that till much later. So, what did she have to resign for? <laughs> I thought um, in a, a great essay, Frank um, Gotero. Um, Essay is called The Life of an Artist or How to Understand Left Wing Jewelry. Uh, he uh, wrote that Bengalis' dildo was the last stop before boredom washed over the art world <laughs> after the bullshit of the 1970s when everyone tried something new every five minutes because it was possible to try something new every five minutes without some asshole commenting, commentating on the lack of coherence or commercial strategy. Who's, who's writing that? Frank Gotero. It's in your. That's so funny. It's it's a, it's yeah. it's a nice line. I think it, it it seems to, reading through all the essays in in, in in the particular book on you, it was amazing how much emotion came out um, by the writers at the the point at which they would see this as a landmark image, a landmark moment in in art that art changed after this. Um, uh, he actually Frank Gotero went on to say that Linda. Bengalis deserves infinitely more than a comeback in the shape of a platinum dildo for services rendered. <laughs> uh, she merits a public apology. Oh. And uh, it's a very That's... sweet thing to yeah. say. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a very, he was here just recently, he'd sell to the exhibition. But I think also, if I could have a piece of tape, Aaron. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry about that, Linda. I think um, one thing that probably does um, make this work resonate with younger artists, especially, um, is that it, it comes also to people um, now, perhaps as coming from, a, from a, a point in time in the New York art world where there were more <laughs> radical communities there, that the artists were, were taking conceivably much, much bigger risks. Um, and this is again what comes through in, in, in reading about you, where people who have talked about this image say, this is the moment when attitude precedes form. <laughs> and that it's, uh, it's, it's um, I think, uh, <laughs> Hickey writes about you saying very, very much so uh, that he, he goes in at this moment of initially attacking the theory that New York should just be about property prices and where artists can afford to be and stuff like that. But <coughs> sort of essentially rounds on a similar thing, which is, he goes on to say, what we have presently is an art world without, if you could just take that to the, the jacket of that sort of thing. Uh, what we have presently is an art world without heroes and mentors, with a surfeit of hall monitors. The plague of AIDS, herpes and heroin in the early 80s thinned the population of art citizens predisposed to taking risks. Um, and I, I, and, and it's, it, it's become, I think, in that sense, a, 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 a marking post, a point from which things changed. Changed in New York as well, and changed within the art system and change within the art market, which is still always incredible about this, that it is a page, it's the adverts pages in art forum, which are now, what, an inch thick. <coughs> I mean, it's, it's become a, a different proposition art forum to what it was then. But you know, that, that was also the Nixonian time where, <coughs> where you couldn't lie, and we knew there, was, there, were, where there were lies. And, and I think it was the first time there was an awareness of, of self-awareness of the media. As, as I said, a self, we were 
we were on the moon. There was a kind of awareness. And it was a change altogether. And I think I, I, I was very much in tune with that. Mm. So I think things changed all over mm. at that time. Um, I, I, I don't want to bring us down for a bit, but just some sad moments in the art world of, uh, of late, least of all the passing of Dor Dorothea Tanning, uh, but, but also Mike Kelly. And uh, that was very sad, I felt. And, and in two different news reviews, LA Times and the BBC report, um, they both alluded to Kelly's um, dissatisfaction with the art world and the way it had turned out. Um, it, he complained that it become too corporate. Oh, everything's too corporate. <laughs> You know, it has been. We we all know that, and and it's wonderful that you know there there are voices now everywhere in the world. Do you still teach? I do. I've been teaching for over I think thirty five years at Visual Arts. Uh, I I go there one quarter semester a year, and I wasn't even aware that I'd been there that long. <laughs> until I decided this year, I took one break one year, maybe ten years ago, and I decided, okay, this year, I'm going to take another break. Mm -hmm. I would, I would love it if Linda Bengliss were my art teacher. Oh. I think that would be quite something. Can you just tell us a, a little bit more about this work, which appeared later, the amazing Bow Wow? We did it. I won a grant in '75. The art firm was. The idea of it was in '71, and our, and uh, I remember asking. Uh, I think it was uh, was Charlie Coles gave a, a spring drinking party in East Hampton, and I said, I would like to do something of a centerfold, and this was before Pigaswood said he would like the article. And so Charlie gave me a t-shirt, and then I kind of made the lettering, elongated it, and, and later with the t-shirt anyway. And, and Bill Weege, uh was part of the, when, when the artists uh, were picketing against the war, they decided, uh, Henry of Dallas, Fort Worth, decided uh, he'd take the artist and uh, have them do posters. That was Rauschenberg Morris and all the well-known blue, blue chip artists at the time. Uh, and so I couldn't withdraw. Every artist was withdrawing from their major shows. So that's when I did the Carl Andre uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth. And that's when I did Janie Seeley's show and before I went to uh, Germany, because it was about the war. So I felt the, the energy that we were speaking of and the, at this time, uh, I, I felt that I had one more idea, and that was uh, because the, I think the ad was called an ad, and it wasn't an ad. I wanted it to be something else. And so I decided I would make a video tape, and I did it in collaboration with two other artists. Uh, Rena Small played the dog. She was a student at CalArts. We had another CalArts student make the dog costume. And Stanton Kay, who was an underground filmmaker, made two films only, ever, and uh, was my husband in this kind of get about a hermaphroditic dog. It was about a dog that could sing and dance, that happened to be hermaphroditic, just like we happen to be who we are. So this, this dog, Rena's posing there, and had genitals, and I don't think they're fully extended, nor do you see the vagina, but the vagina was that large, and the, the other member, the male member, was extended, when extended. We had to, because I got a grant from, uh, from, uh, from Upper State New York, we had to have the dog covered with a kind of diaper. So we, we kind of made it into a kind of, we had a cute little kind of bikini stripe, uh, black and gold uh, 
to cover the genitals when we had it uh, running out near Niagara Falls, but it was, it was a wonderful <laughs> skit about the poor dog who's mistaken, uh, got his tongue cut off by the owner, Babu Fakir, and I was Rexena. So, you, of course, you know, Babu Fakir, <laughs> you know, and, and Rexena uh, had an argument about the dog. I thought the dog was the female, he thought the dog was the male. And so we have an argument, and of course he cuts off the tongue instead of the genitals. Another great... The dog is the artist. Another great cover and image. What was Exeter? Well, this is some, some magazine that... <laughs> That's a good. That's a good question. Some magazine, <laughs> and and this is the this was the failure because Paula Cooper came into the at Paula. It was my opening. It was announcement for my opening. Uh, the other side said Linda Bengliss presents her metalized knots. So they took that pin up, and and uh, Annie Lieberwitz was actually photographing me for the New York Times uh, Center Center. Page. They had an article on artists, and she was hoping to get the cover, and and um, and I got to know Annie, so I had her do that. She even went scuba diving with me, and I think I really got her into that kind of performance photography, because she, you know, we did some things, and I even had her documenting this fake kind of situation and a love scene with uh, Chuck Arnoldi and myself, kind of, I had an evening gone on and fake lover be in, you know. And, and uh, so this particular one was an announcement for the Paula Cooper, Linda Bengliss presents her metalized knots, in which I also had the other pieces uh, that you saw in that photograph that, of, of the poured pieces and the pieces with the columns and plastic where I was presenting fake pieces as well as real plants. But this particular piece, somebody came in and said, who did that to her? And I knew I failed, that that was the wrong thing to do. Even though I was using myself as an object, I was still an object in the male gaze. And I realized that that's why I turned around, bought the dildo, and realized no gaze, no particular gaze. How do you, how, we're going to, this is smile, and I, I, I did want to um, just ask you that question. How, how, where does Linda Benningless sit with, in relation to feminism? Walk the line. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's the me. <laughs> that's been that's been the constant, hasn't it? Really, Change, well, challenging sure. boundaries. Is it sure, painting? Is sure. it sculpture? Is yeah, it all yeah. for? This, the, the, I did the five dildos for the five critics that gang banged me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've heard it here first. Um, <laughs> peacock fans. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, this, is, this is Robert Morrison and, and Rauschenberg, I believe, nominated you to be an artist in residence in a project in uh, Ahmedabad. And uh, here we see one of your peacock fans from 79, which you made when you were, were in, in, in India. <coughs> I mean, India is a big fascination for you, right? I mean, tell me about these works as well. Well, they're always having festivals, and, and th these were things that you could buy on the street. And I was... Uh, commissioned to do uh, for the Dallas opening airport something. I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I thought I was going to do maybe some fans, some goalie fans, but once I got to India, uh, that changed. So I began to kind of experiment with different things, different ideas, but essentially changing changing some ideas. This is a marvelous group of things you found. Thank you. you know, this is very, <laughs> I was, I went to, well, you know, it's, I look like I'm in a hearse, that's what's so interesting. <laughs> Dead. And I'd just been to a wedding, 
probably drank some, but I was kind of resting. And the photographer, you know who the photographer was? Very famous fellow that's, I uh, can't think of his name right now, but he's very famous. And he just turned around and I knew he was shooting me. I wasn't asleep, but you know. But but it's just a wonderful photo. Does anyone here know the name Peter of it? It's Peter Hujan. Is it? No. No? No, it's a we'll come American, back to it. American photographer, yes, but uh, shown everywhere and he's he's known for these just continually taking photographs. He's, and uh, his wife catalogs them, but I, I mean, he's just... If Rosie's here, she could grab the book and find them out who. It would be good. But could we just talk also about the brick uh, that you made? So in India, uh, Anand, my, my um, partner friend there, wanted me to cover some wells. Uh, and they were four by four feet. I, I was interested in making fountains. I'd already done a World's Fair fountain uh, in New Orleans, which was the last World's Fair. And, but he, he was interested in me making a sculpture without water. So I made this kind of uh, planter. I don't even think of it as a planter, but I, I made this elephantine kind of image that on one side was an elephant with buttresses, and the other side looks like a vase. And it, I did a trapezoid wall, and then just started drawing in it, and then began with a carver that had never carved brick. But the idea of the brick being the carving stone, so to speak, or carving to carve brick, uh, that was put together like that occurred to me because I saw some advertisement of a brick wave and it captured my mind uh, just this idea of digital that it was kind of a digitized thing that you know got your attention so that so I did this that's all it just reminded me that I should do something about it so then I did some snake elements that actually in India, the, the people began worshiping because there's a snake day, and they do draw little snakes and they bring offerings. They draw on with chalk onto this snake, which was wrapped around a tree. And there were young trees that were also there, and at one point the older tree fell, some of it, and so I had to do it again, and then I did it uh, as if it were kind of coiling its way, it's unclear, away, or it coiled toward the, the old tree again. Tell me about the, the knots. Well, the, this one kind of, the knots were kind of portraits of people I knew, and they, they did like their knot, they didn't know. It, you know, I, I found that the kind of character of the person I could do them. And I think of this as somebody I know. Is and this, it, is this? One of them, I think, that is in the show is, was Donald Droll's knot. And this was Mary McFadden's knot. I mean, not knot. It was just, this was one of the very first uh, flounces that I did or exposed. This is. Um uh, a picture, I, I'm going to ask you where it was taken, but you can see some of the knots around and then some sort of fairy lights or something. What's, yeah, what's this was the there? clock tower in yeah. which Nixon said, uh, don't use Christmas lights. So with one little plug and a 110, I lit up the whole tower yeah. blinking. Yeah. And you could see it from both highways. He, he, Nixon put out a national plea for yeah, to no stop Christmas lights. wasting electricity. Yeah, and then so no. He lit up the clock tower. Yeah, <laughs> blinking. Yeah. And then there was also, don't buy gas after a certain yeah. time. I, I just bought the Porsche in Portland. <laughs> <laughs> Sparkle pieces after that. And then had to stop at a Best Western. I was so excited about the Porsche. I drove all day and all night, but then got out of gas. So I had to stop at a place for two or three hours until they opened the gas station. And then I went on. What, um, tell me what do you think about the recent sort of roundup shows that they're That's doing? That's the clock tower again, again lighting yeah. up the staircase. 
Um, the tendency for these uh, for shows like Whack, uh, Els at Pompidou, uh, which you've been included in, right? I mean, what, what's your feeling about those those shows which have happened recently, which attempt to sort of round up women artists in the 60s, 70s? You know, I'm not altogether familiar with, with what, what, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I don't, I, you know, do you, what do you think? Um, well, I think it was, um, it was necessary on one level because it was artists often coming to museum level who maybe hadn't up until then, and I got a sense of the curators were searching possibly for entry of certain artists into the main body of the collection. Um, Els at Pompidou was an interesting one. A, a friend of mine reminded me that, that Pompidou has a tendency to try and do round-up shows. Al you know, China, Africa, yes, yes. women. And, uh, and I think in that sense it was perhaps a little bit more uncertain of itself. Whack, I think, I think it needed to kind of take place. It's, it sort of started the debate at a point where um, actually we, we needed to sort of it needed, uh, on one level, the, the sense of bringing it together so we could see it and acknowledge it and, and, and work with it. Um, but that's, that's loosely what I thought. I don't know if, it, if, if it's for the women artists in those shows, for instance, a bit too much, like, you know, being a, men at Pompidou would be... This weird. was a couple of years ago, you know? Yeah. I saw it, but, you know, yeah. I, I don't think it felt like anything exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem, and, you know, yeah. and, and maybe it's a space, but yeah. I, I think the way you put together the information, for yeah. instance, here, yeah. downstairs, was exciting. This is you in have numbers, a, yeah, the, yeah. Show. yeah. And what are you calling it? In numbers. In numbers. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. I, I think there is, I, I, I think the quality of presentation in the space is so important. Yeah. And, I'd be really, I'd be very interested to hear what people think about those shows who, who did experience them. Um, I, I look here now at a, this is an Ocular magazine, and there you are. I wanted to ask what, what looking at that picture of yourself now, where, where were you as an artist? You've been through quite a bit with the art forum ad and everything else. At what point are you in this, in, in, in your career as an artist when this is taken? Uh, ready to go elsewhere. Mm. And I, I just left California. Mm -hmm. um, I I done these pieces. They were slug or snail-like pieces, but I also was thinking of uh, Greece, and I was thinking of um, I, I don't know where they came from. It was mm -hmm. kind of unconsciousness, but uh, uh, unconscious. But the the uh, it seems like there was kind of a flag-like image in the surrealist of the Picasso on the beach. It seemed like they, they came from uh, sea anemones. Uh, they, they came from my experience scuba diving. At the same time, um, I was thinking about classical torsos. They hark back to kind of, uh, uh, I had horses. Uh, this is a male figure, by the way. Uh, I did two male figures. One was a portrait, mm. and and I wanted to shoot the person, so I kept putting an X on it, and I finally let the X stay there. And I, the rest are very female. They have their double, double mermaids. Is it possible just to mention a, a few words about your connection with Greece? I know that you, you did a show at the Cycladic Museum. That, so well, I thought of these as yeah. kind of figures out of some, I don't know, underwater Cycladic yeah. thing, you know. Yeah. But they were kind of like, they were vessels, and where the air, the spirit was contained in the hollow. You know, trees have that kind of quality of uh, animus, or hollows. And and, and bases, and I've always been interested in urns. These are the, the, the pleats, and this is a picture, if I'm right, this is taken by hands now. This is... Yes, probably, yeah. Um, a body of there's, works. There's the piece that's in the show, if you want to back Sorry? up. This piece on the left is yeah. Kajal, the piece that's in the show now. The exhibition here. So you see some of the works that were done at that time. So I think the piece I'm holding now, uh, 
I, I think I own, I, I, I've, uh, I've kept one piece from each kind of period, basically. And these are very, um... And this is a Fandango. Yeah. This, this, these are my very first fans. And they're, they're, they're very, they're very, um, these are works coming in at the late 80s or thereabouts. I don't know. I'm I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, these are, 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 yeah. are quite away from certain works. Yeah, it was before I went to India. That's yeah. all I know. So late 80s, yeah. Mm -hmm. I went to India in 89, 90. So these are much later. Uh, first I was folding on the horizontal and I began to fold on the diagonal. So this is an early bronze piece that uh, actually I was going to, it's actually on the diagonal. Maybe, let's see. No, it's not on the diagonal. Anyway, I was going to uh, chrome, I was chroming some pieces and the, I had a commission in San Francisco and I had to, to, for outside, so I was trying to do some black chroming. And, um, but it never, they never got there. Well, one I destroyed and the other one. Just I think about your work, and, uh, and it comes. In, in, it seems to come in series or groups. I mean, you've got Pinto series, four paintings, Peacock fans, Pleat series, Sparkle knots. Um, are, are you working in, in, in like book form of this, of this open and closed chapters? Uh, how, I think so. Yeah, well, so somehow the ideas and they keep returning, and um, I, I think actually. I find myself uh, very interested in the gestalt now, how you read an image as well as the texture. The texture makes the form. That's always been the case, but right now with these drawing pieces, I draw the form, mm. uh, similar on top of something. Mm. And so the black piece that you see in the show now, if you go to see the show, you'll, you'll see that it's a kind of mermaid form, so it repeats some of these ideas but it looks very differently. And I'm also working them in phosphorescence, and the arms that you see, I have a phosphorescent egg that's on exhibit now at the American Academy of Fifth Avenue, with, lit with black light, because I like the black lighting now. I, I must say I'm impressed by the amount of um, the, the, the different media you've worked across um, before, including video, as we know, and then also um, ceramics, which we see here. I mean, it's extruded ceramics where we yeah. were making our own clay and glazes. It was a lot of fun in Taos. But I went different places, even in Tucson, to make some extruded ceramics. I mean, often in your production, it's a social, it feels like a social production, dependent on who you're with, who you meet, what, what kind of social what, context what, comes out. What, what I'm able to, yeah. Well, this, particularly with the glass, glass is very social. Uh, the, the, these were done in New Zealand. I wanted, the New Zealand artists up until that time had never collaborated in a sense. So when I went to my first party there, and they're very uh, kind of Protestant in their ethic to work. So they, they, they said that they gave me a little party when I arrived after traveling, you know, for whatever it was, 48 hours. And they said, well, where are you getting to work? And I said, I'm working now. And they just, <laughs> their faces just dropped. <laughs> But I think everything is always working, you know. I like to wake up and wherever I am, uh, it's a new, it's a new place, you know. And then that was with the ceramic extruded. Yeah. They made huge pots with these extruded members, and I thought of Eva Hess and her little. I knew her then when she was yeah. making these translucent uh, plastic things, and she had made them this high, and she had made them with a group over in. Staten Island, and then she said, well, I think I'm going to enlarge them, which she did. They were like little trash cans that were kind of, you know, very, and she, and they were, you know, and I thought of her, but also thought of Pat Steer and her, you know, dripping and her, you know, and so I glazed them with this flat uh, metal glaze, and the metal sand, the black sand that the Japanese took from the New Zealanders, uh, so there were paintings on the outside. And black sand, very black sand, sparkly, very refined sand. So that's how I showed them in New Zealand. 
And no collector bought them at the time, so I think they went back to the ceramic place where they were made. And then I did these, I went to check, and I did uh, drawings. In fact, Dale Chihuly, I did these sort of things and did a, a design, I designed a, a chandelier, and Dale was only doing stacked plates up until that time, and he knew about my balloons, which I'd done, and of course he's carried it to its, with the same people that I was working with at Pilchuck. Dale, I was one of the first artists that Dale invited Dale has a, a show on now, I He does, I've seen it, and, and, and he has, yeah, he has a piece in yeah. the hotel, I think. In, in carriages. Yeah. <laughs> Huge end. Yeah, yeah, very dusty, which things do get <laughs> very dusty everywhere in cities. I have the same problem, getting it dusty. And, but these, these uh, anyway, the idea of the balloons and putting two colors together, uh, the Czech people had never done it. And one thing Americans do with glass that they, they did not do, uh, they, they, you, we, basically artists were invited there and glass people were really pushing glass to the limit. And I saw in the history of glass, I saw that it's the kind of tendency of artists to do, to see what they can do. <coughs> the Czech would never take the hot flame and use it to keep it hot and to keep pushing and then put it in the kneeling oven. They would not contaminate anything. These were, this was a whole factory that I was able to take over just after the Republic came, a year or so afterwards. So they were very paranoid uh, about renting cars, about even letting us out of the hotel. We were locked into this rooming house above the bar, and it was kind of scary because we didn't know whether we had to jump out to get to the factory. We were supposed to be there at 6 o'clock in the morning. And what was so wonderful about the factory was they would work and sweat and they would drink beer like this. And they would go back on and they would function. This just beer and eat sausages every four hours. And, <laughs> and then I heard from a student at Visual Arts that, because I visited many factories around, including factories that did crystal castings and then carving and etching. All these factories are gone, she said, because of the Euro situation. And I thought that's such a tragedy that so many of the countries, the poor countries, that were supported, you know, in this particular case by the Russians, and their art, are gone. It's gone. I'm, I'm going to open up questions pretty soon to the audience, but just to ask you, where 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 are you where are you at now? Are you in the studio? Or are you at the foundries? Or everywhere. Or? Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you're at, you're having this great show. I'm having fun. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to quickly uh, uh, show, if I may, skip to the picture here of you with the lovely pie. pie. Uh, pie is in the room with us somewhere, um, and yes. pie. I mean, let's get this clear. Pi has now got his own passport. Is that? Correct? Well, we're we're working on it, so she can come back. <laughs> so we spent three weeks uh, visiting three hospitals, uh, two in New York area, and uh, yeah, Pi's. This is this is in my little office where I have older pieces, and and uh, I I don't get rid of anything. I just collect places. So they kind of remain the way I left them 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> Thank you for now, Linda. Thank I you. What would be great is if uh, anyone does have any questions, uh, a microphone will come to you. And, uh, and, and uh, it would be good if someone had a question now. Does anyone want to hold their hand up? There's a lady yes. at the front. Partly because I just saw the Yayo Kusama show, the tape. I was wondering if you came across her in New York when you were there. I Yayo haven't Kusama. Seen that. Um, but so much of her soft works yes. seemed to relate to what you were doing, and it was the same period of time in a way. Yes. I, I, I saw, the last time I saw pieces of hers, well, she has a great piece in Corpus Christi oh. that leads to the Gulf, that's, you know, where 
after she painted the, the concrete, uh, the stone leading outside the Corpus Christi Museum. And I saw some pieces of hers from Florida. I haven't seen a show. Uh, I, I saw at the time in Miami when I was there, had a fountain there, I saw some of the video. And, and I, 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 I don't and didn't understand her work. I don't. Because I, but I would like to see this show because, because um, I, I think I work within a context each time, whether it's clear or not. I, I have some kind of formal, and I'm sure she's formal, but I don't, I don't know. I don't know that. And, and uh, so I can't say. I really can't say. Uh, I'm curious about the show. I haven't seen anything since I've been here. I've just been here. This is only the, the next four. This is the, I've been here about 48 hours. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I'm not sure. It's a question. <laughs> I was wondering about your video pieces because that your well-known work in video is only from the 70s. Um, I was wondering if you stopped working on video, if you continued working, and uh, just is not the I, the most recent uh, thing I did that I was happy about. I I. Uh, I documented uh, a burning of a woman that was uh, a noble woman in India, and she was very, I was there at the time of her death, and I, I, actu I actually documented the funeral, and I was, I was, I was glad that I did that. I, I don't know whether I will show it, because it was a private funeral. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it was interesting. For me to do, and that's how I feel with most of the work. So I'm curious what you wanted to hear from me about Kasama. <laughs> what What was the question? Yeah. What is the question? Well, the question really was because I'm I'm just interested in that particular moment in New York, and you know the relationship. When Gregor <coughs> asked about the relationship between artists at that time, and it's I kind of now her. Yeah, I was just curious because we're on the mat together now along with uh, Whitman painting. It's just and I found out a funny juxtaposition of surfaces, maybe. I haven't seen the three, but someone... Because when you're trying to put together the female sensibility, in a sense, yeah. which is what we were talking about before, yeah. there's this kind of you know, group of women who work in, a, in, a, in the soft, almost, what I'm saying, yeah. you know, yeah. the bourgeois. The well, I think she was ahead of me, ahead of my time. She's mm -hmm. a little bit older. And I know, I, yeah. I, I don't think she ever questioned what's, as I, as I felt I was, I was out there, Eva Haas didn't care. I said, what about being a female? I visited her studio. She said, that's not important. She said, but this is, and she showed me her number. Yeah. So she was an input then. And Donald Drill and Lu Lucy Laporte, who did a, documents on her, he was her, her gallerist, they didn't know that about her. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that that's what she revealed to me. Mm -hmm. She didn't live long enough to answer it, really. Question here. I don't know. You know, I don't know that Kazama would answer it. This is what I'm saying. I mean, you do what you do. Hello, thanks for coming. Um, I, I looked actually to try and, and buy a copy of the, the aforementioned art forum, and um, it goes for a lot of money on Abe books, as you probably know. In fact, it, it might have ironically be it, an, an individual issue might be going for four thousand dollars, which I think no, is. No, I can't a, believe that. Uh, I, I think no it, well, wonder I can't keep it. Well, that, which, which leads to my question, which is. I have my sunglasses. They're for sale. <laughs> <laughs> which leads to my question, which is. Um, it seems to me corporations are very clever at absorbing the radical and, mark and using it for marketing purposes. How, yeah. do, how does an artist keep one step ahead of that game? I don't know any corporations. Can you introduce me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in making fountains. <laughs> well, that's an interesting. I mean, do you, think, do, you don't regard it as a contest, maybe. You think that you could use them to further your... You mean, some people would say that a who's radical... A, who's the subject? 
So with you as an artist, somebody ah, would say that a radical artist is in competition with corporations and the mainstream. But other people may say it's something that a, a radical artist would work with and absorb and try and work with Coca-Cola, for instance. Do you have a view on that? Or? Well, you, yeah. you know, that question of what is radical has been around for years and nobody can answer it. Yeah. <laughs> really. Yes. So you don't concern yourself with that sort of issue? It's no, all, it's I think, wrong question. Uh, you know, I think that's a 40 or 50 year old question, maybe. <laughs> don't you think? I mean, where, where did, you know, what, what does it, all of that mean? I mean, and why are we so concerned with the sexes? I mean, sex is good, you know? <laughs> of any type, right? <laughs> There's, a, um, there's, there's um, illustrations in your in, in your catalog of art forums of, the, of that issue where the page is ripped out because so many of the distributors of art forum at the time, even art galleries, were, were tearing out the page because they found it so outrageous. Cindy well, Sherman it's, it's, has kept it's... her copy of the art forum with the page torn out. Well, Cindy, when yeah. I first met her in Buffalo, mm. was was involved with cutouts from magazines and and I remember I showed some of these uh, role-playing things that Morris and I were experimenting with and and I and I remember Sarah not long afterwards seeing him at a party and and he said I know people that are you know experimenting with roles what are you going to do about I, I wasn't interested I just did that movie and that was it you know that it's not a movie it's a video but I didn't want to continue to kind of, to role play and to, because I never considered myself the object. I, it just, I just wanted to do what I did. And, and um, I, 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 I don't know what I'm involved with, you know? I just am. <laughs> There's one more question over here. Perhaps this could, we, we this could be our last for now, if that's okay. Um, you said that the texture creates the form. Where? There you are, yeah. 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 Oh, there. Yeah. Um, okay. The texture creates the form. Yeah. But now you're more interested in gestalt. Could you say something more about that? Well, it's... Uh, what, what, why do you put them... Uh, against one another. The way we see, we see about 30 degrees. And so I'm interested in what we see and how we take it in and, and how, we, how we really visualize. And, and uh, you know, dogs have a sense of smell. We don't smell necessarily, but something can, I mean, Cezanne can make you smell an apple, you know? So, what what do, what do we do? What do we experience when we see something? And that's my interest. Whether it's buoyant, whether it has weight, whether it's hollow, whether it's solid, uh, whether it's translucent, whether it emits light, um, and what does texture do? <coughs> uh, what does the what do the borders do? And, and the piece that you may see in the show there, the black piece, yeah. is doing a lot of different things. And uh, I found that I can continue working with what these things do. I've always been involved with the linearity of the pieces, the profile, what happens, the form, the texture, the light. Uh, and I seem to kind of let it kind of hang out more, let, let the form to be more loose or tight. Um, so the texture and the form and the gestalt, whatever that iconography is of what it gives back to you, as well as the image, what, okay. what is it? Uh, I think we, we ask that every day of our lives. In, in our dreams we ask it, what do we dream? What, what was the formation? What was the idea? What's What's the story? I mean, we have, we're always asking these questions every day. So that's why I say that's, that's who we are. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we all should give Linda a really big round of applause. Well, thank you.